Hello, everyone. Hello. I am Hansel Bowman. I'm an architect here at Gallaudet University and have been for seven years now. And my presentation is the stories of what I've learned from the deaf community here and how that speaks to the story of deaf people searching for the space of their own. And within the broader world, how we also are looking for sustainability and livability. And this is, in fact, the story of how deaf space, this innate knowledge and wisdom that deaf people have around architecture, how that actually tells new and inspiring stories of different approaches we can take to architecture that start internally, physically with the body, and then become, uh, a res as a result, a more empathetic design. In my uh, childhood, I grew up and became an architect uh, during the time of what's known as the modern paradigm in architecture. So I'm going to be referring to modern paradigm a number of times in my presentation today. The modern paradigm always thinks of the building first in terms of building a beautiful thing and the building being of great import, but the people are not attended to as well. So in this process, we, we have to start thinking less about the abstract first and more about the people because they've been secondary to our notions of building, especially deaf people. Especially deaf people. So if we think first in the abstract and think secondarily of the people, then there's a disconnect that's critical. It creates stressors and isolation. It creates conflict for the people inhabiting the buildings. So my question for all of you now is how in the design world we can create more sustainable design and design wherein there is not the disconnect between the people and the architecture of the space itself. So now I want to look at new approaches to more sustainable worlds and uh, greater connection between the people in the uh, buildings that they inhabit. So I want to contrast this modern paradigm with the organic paradigm. And when I came to Gallaudet, when I came to Gallaudet, that's when I began to learn about this. I really learned about it here because they don't teach it in architecture. So if we look at the design of a nest, for example, this is the space in which a, a, a newborn bird is born. And so the design of the nest itself reflects its use, reflects the uh, creatures that inhabit it. So we have to look at these kinds of notions to truly build a sustainable world. And we have to think a little bit more now about the search of deaf people for space of their own. So I'd like to share with you three different quotes that establish this philosophical foundation. The first is that the desire to establish a standing space which one owns, which proves the existence of its owner. The need of human identity, that we must first identify the human identity of a space before we identify the space itself. We also have to look at the fact that peoples and cultures have different languages, but at the same time, they also have different sensitivities to the world. They attend to different things in their world. So if we study this a bit and study this search of a, for a space of our own, we have to think about what that means, how we integrate with these spaces. In recent history, we've seen these conversations begin. Many deaf students grow up going to schools for the deaf. And that's their background for their learning and establishes a great deal of their identity. Well, design has a great impact on the uh, schools themselves. Whether or not they create senses of isolation and stresses and the notion that uh, the, the, the buildings can reinforce external perceptions of a group that can have a negative impact on one's own identity development. That can also have a negative impact on 
a person's well-being. So, indeed, we all agree that this has a negative effect, but we also have to look at positive effects here as well because it, it creates a deep need, a deep desire to create a space that is home. And there's a wonderful example of this. Some nine years ago, a group of deaf people gathered together to work together to create a new community in Laurent, South Dakota. And this was a wonderful idea. I, I agree. Now, I, I, we all know that that's not currently built, but you know, there's a lot of uh, energy required to make that happen. And so it speaks to the great deep-seated desire to have a space where one's own language and one's own culture are present, one's own way of being and interconnectedness with each other and the space is existent. Every day, deaf people experience different kinds of struggles with their environment. The environment is designed by people like me, hearing architects, and that's a problem. It doesn't really fit the ways of being and, and ways of seeing and language of deaf people. How we are informed of things we, we, in the space that we don't see, the space behind us, for example, by lighting, by other architectural features, is important. It has an effect on the well-being of the people inhabiting those buildings. There is something positive in, to be found in this, though, that it inspires new notions about how we modify the world, modify uh, spaces and architecture to fit ways of being. Architects also have their own language of meaning. So we have to examine how this fits with uh, deaf ways of being and a visual language. We also have to look at the sensory reach that the space allows. We know that we extend sensory reach behind us where we can't see to in infer information about our world. But how do we do this collectively and as a culture within the deaf world? There are three powerful impacts to be found on these basic ideas of form, lighting, and material. Some of the language of architecture refers to, to these ideas. We have to look also in a visual language at what are the proximic requirements, the lighting requirements that allow that visual language to occur. Given a visual language, we have to think about what is the background for that visual language. How do we encourage greater sensory reach? What also are the materials that we're working with that propagate vibration, that inform me about things happening within my environment? How do we design a space that promotes a uh, collective discussion, uh, people unified together, in uh, visual design that is more cohesive? And if we take all of these ideas together and put them together in a single room, you can see some of the implications here. Because in a building uh, designed by Ed Hop Edward Hopper, the artist, he gives us a visualization of what this kind of interconnectedness of a space and its people would look like. In this image, we see people gathered together for a very tight-knit conversation. But, and you see also how the light is pooling around the people and creating a mood in the environment in this painting. So that you have both the private conversation and the public space in balance. Here at Gallaudet, we also have had the opportunity to build two new buildings based on these concepts of deaf space. The first one was the SLCC. And in that building, we started the process of workshopping, wherein we gathered deaf people to gather together to share ideas about space, how we could build it in an open way. And this building was completed in 2009. And you can see many of the ideas coming to fruition there. However, some missed the mark. And so this puzzled us. We wondered why we'd missed the mark in such a way. But we realized that we went about the process somewhat wrongly. 
I say that because the SLCC was designed using the modern paradigm, contrasting that with the organic deaf paradigm. And so that continued throughout the development of that building. So then we tried a newer approach on our next building. And you can see that in our new dormitory. You'll see here two pictures uh, showing the design of the large public space room and how it's designed for a visual language. You'll see that in its tiered sections. And so that can allow for three dis disparate uh, areas of conversation or discussion or one as a whole. And the major difference here is that, you know, it was des uh, designed by deaf people. It had deaf people involved in the architecture of it. And one of the things that I think is so cool about that is the nature of the tiered, uh, tiered stages sets a material grounding that people are then connected to in, tr in an uh, intricate way. This is much more the organic approach, the more uh, organic paradigm which is essentially the deaf paradigm as well. It, we see this referred to in the field of architecture as the vernacular approach. The vernacular approach looks to how we create connectedness in our approach to the buildings that we build. So how do uh, deaf people connect to these spaces? This presents a number of challenges. So now we have an environment that has uh, lots of isolation uh, and uh, stressors. How do we transform that? We do that by making the environment and its negative impact on the spirit and the body and the stressors. We transform that. So we have to look at how design can create a more sustainable world that eliminates as many of these stressors as possible. I'm going to now show you three very exciting challenges that we have in the world of architecture that Deaf Space poses to us. Deaf Space really is, presents positive solutions to all of these. The first is we look at our populations aging, and you know, we age pretty quick, I certainly know that. <laughs> But we have solutions to some of these uh, uh, effects of aging. Universal design, how we design spaces for all people, including the elderly. Now we also are faced with issues of climate change now. Well, the, the world of design has approached this by trying to build green, more sustainable buildings. We also have now more than ever before in history people congregating in cities and urban environments which create additional stressors. But once again, we have solutions to this. In looking at social equity and design and planning and, and these business and economic approaches to equity are three approaches to external problems within the world that are, are, are present. So, but one thing we haven't yet thought about is how the body and the design integrate. And we haven't thought about this in this visceral way. For many years, deaf people have known these things innately, how to alter the environment so that it fits their way of embodiment. So what I propose now is some specific examples of how deaf people can contribute to solving some of these great problems in our world today. One of them, one of these is promoting the idea of embodied design so that within the design process, we can you know, inspire new ways of teaching empathetic design. Design wherein the environment and the design policy is affected by this understanding of the people. This will also have an effect on the business of design and architecture. The main point of this is that deaf people do so by leading by examples. Also, we have to think about you know, uh, who makes change happen in these approaches. If we're building a building, then it, we have to have deaf space principles incorporated into it. And we now have a worldwide community of deaf architects here at Gallaudet and other designers that can create this change more broadly in the world.
If we look at the Sixth Street Properties Development, we are trying to de design around deaf space concepts there and doing so successfully. So we have to think about development policy and design policy for our world as a whole. So in closing, uh, for my presentation, I'd like to just thank all of the people in the deaf community who have taught me so much about how we can approach the world differently. With that, I thank you.